Now there's a uh, in the book of Job. You'll see the lofty friends. The, they're the pillars of the community there, and they're pillars uh, there in their lofty towers. The friends of Job. For a whole week, they didn't say a word because they saw the extent of his suffering. And then, it almost sounds like poetry. It almost sounds like literature, except there's these little things that come out now and then. And you see, that these were real conversations. And the one thing that really surprises me in the book of Job is those little glimpses where Job says, Oh, I wish that my words could be inscribed on iron or stone. That they would remain forever. I'm paraphrasing. But he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will see him. Not a stranger's eyes, but my own. I myself in this flesh will see him. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And that, ironically, those very words were inscribed on stone throughout the globe on tombstones all over the world testifying that the Redeemer does live. Now, interesting thing in the book of Job is throughout he's talking about his righteousness but he also calls himself quite the sinner. He knows he's a sinner but he knows he's not guilty of anything to bring all this calamity about. So what do the lofty ones say over and over? They say the right words. Everything you expect a religious person to say. But Job, in chapter 24, he says something that kind of takes me back a little bit because he's not talking about himself at all. He's talking about the poor throughout the earth and those who suffer and um, he, he understands that he's not a righteous man throughout the rest of the book. But he asked the question, why doesn't... Well, I wish that there was one that's a mediator between God and man. So, in chapter 24, though, he's talking about the suffering of people, the poor and the needy. And that they... The, um, that people, the evil ones, steal a flock and provide pasture for it. They drive away the donkeys owned by the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as collateral. They push the needy off the road. The poor of the land are forced into hiding. Like wild donkeys, they go in the desert. The poor go about to their task of foraging for food. And the, the answer, what answer does uh, Billy add, or however you say it, say? talks about the greatness of God and how much less is man who is a maggot the son of man who is a worm that was his answer so what is Job's reply to that oh how you have helped the powerless and delivered the arm that is weak how you have counseled the unwise and thoroughly explained the path to success that's sarcasm now John in the gospel of John chapter 14 gives the, one of the answers to this no I'm sorry John chapter 17 Father the hour has come glorify your son so that the son may glorify you for you gave him all authority over all flesh so that he may give eternal life to all who you have given him the answer is in the cross the very suffering that our Savior did didn't seem to have an answer, but it gave us the only means by which we may be saved. I, For Jesus says in chapter, verse 6, I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that all things you have given to me are from you. Because the words you have gave me, I have given them. They believe them, they have received them, and have known for certain that I came from you. 
they believed that you sent me. So, the answer is in our Savior and our Lord. It was in the springtime that love tends to blossom, right? I'm going somewhere with this. It was in the springtime that in the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, that he talks about the exuberance of creation of nature re reveling in the glories of springtime of, of life. And, and uh, that's when I met my beloved, my, my lovely one, my bride. And how does the Lord see us? And how, when did he redeem us? In the springtime. Now, you can take these analogies only so far. It's um, a br bride and bridegroom, father and children. That's the best one, I believe. And shepherd and sheep. But they only go so far because the relationship is so mysterious and complex that there's not one simple analogy that fits all. But for our purposes, as a father, I if you said something against my daughter or my child, or if you said something against my beloved wife, um, you better hide because that's the that same heart you could see it in the Song of Songs. You have, you have my heart, you have um, ta taken hold of my heart with one glance of your eyes. When, when the believer comes to Jesus Christ with one look, and they hold on, he sees us no longer as the impure or soiled, but as redeemed, as it says in the book of Job, I know my Redeemer lives. Though he says he's a sinner and he knows it. He knows his Redeemer lives and there is a mediator between God and man. And that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in the spring we are saved. In the springtime. And then we find that life. And in the chapter of Revelation 22, 21, you have some of the answers also to all that suffering. Behold the Lord himself, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the creator, and he's the author of our salvation. He alone is worthy of glory and praise, and we will find our rest and our peace in him. So, thank God for that. All praise to our Lord, glorious Savior, Jesus Christ.